Blake Seabolt is the gentleman's name. He was a college student, and he was trying to put, him, put his way through, through college, trying to pay his bills, and so he would deliver pizzas. You may remember going and doing some of that yourself. Uh, one day, Blake tells the story, the, the, the bill for the pizzas that he was bringing to the home came to exactly $40 on the, on the button, $40. So as he came and he knocked on the door with pizzas, hot piping pizzas in his hand, a seven-year-old boy had in his hand two $20 bills and a $5 bill. <coughs> now as the seven-year-old boy was walking to the door, Blake could see that the, the seven-year-old took the five and pocketed it. Blake was going, oh my goodness, what's going on? So the seven-year-old boy dutifully you know, opened the door and gave the $40 for the $40 bill, and Blake gave the pizzas. And as the kid turned around and walk, walked away, Blake said, wait a second, was that, was that the tip? And the seven-year-old responded, yeah, it was. Pretty good tip from walking to the living room and back, right? <laughs> you know, I think that story uh, illustrates it for us, for us very well that God oftentimes <coughs> entrusts us with specifically money that he's intending for us to bless others with. And so often, what do we do? And I'm guilty of this myself. What do we do? We, we pocket the money. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that was read for us this morning, it sets up the, the story where Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. And so I want to simply speak to you a message this morning titled, Giving by faith. And I want to show you a map. I want to begin this way by a map. You guys have that map? <coughs> Wait for while they're while they're getting getting the map up. Oh great, thank you. So I'm while I'm showing you this map, I'm gonna be reading from Acts 16. You need not turn there, but I want to show you this. Okay? Uh, Paul and Luke, and you know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. So Dr. Luke is the author. In Acts 16, it reads this way, that Paul and Luke were in the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Galatia. So where is Phrygia and Galatia? Here's Phrygia. Here's Galatia. They're in Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Where would Asia be? They wanted to go east, right? But for whatever reason, the Spirit of God said, no, 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 I don't want you to go east. It says, and when they had come up to Mycia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. So here's Mycia. They, they wanted to go up into Bithynia, but here's what happened. Passing by Mycia, they went down to Troas, and a, a vision, Paul has a vision, that appears to him in the night. And it's a man of Macedonia. Now see where is Macedonia. Macedonia is right up here, the, the white portion. So they're in Mycia. They're in Phrygia and Galatia, and they're wanting to go into these various areas. But all of a sudden, Paul has a vision, and it's a man of Macedonia standing there urging him, saying, and here's what the man is saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul and Luke and their entourage, they actually go into Macedonia. Now, what do you see in Macedonia? Well, uh, uh, up there towards the top, you see the town called Philippi, where the book of, right, was written to. Now, coming down, you see Amphipolis and Apollonia, and wait a second, you see Berea. Well, there's not a letter to the book, uh, to the church at Berea. We do know this, that Paul commended the, the Bereans. Why? Because they searched the scriptures out to see if those things were so. Their authority was the word of God. But that's not all. It also, you see Thessalonica, where we get the book of Thessalonians. So all because Paul has this vision of Macedonia, we now have churches, and those are the churches that we know of, that letters were written to those specific locales. There probably were other churches. That is, when we read the book of Acts, there's a lot more going on than just simply what we were reading. And so when we arrive in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that Susan read for us this morning, he's talking about 
a, a collection, an offering that was received, that was taken up by the Macedonian churches. And the Macedonian churches were taking up this collection because this money from up here was going to go all the way down to here. Right? You can't wire. There's no first bank of Jerusalem that you can wire the money to. So what do you need to do? Well, you've got to get the first century equivalent of the Pony Express, the Camel Express, maybe they called it. I don't know. And Paul said that he was going to send some men to the church at Corinth because the church at Corinth, they were taking up a collection too. Now the question is, why were they taking up a collection? They were taking up a collection because the church at Jerusalem, there was a regional famine going on. And because of that regional famine, what was the, what was the church at Jerusalem? What were they so well known for? They took care of their widows. They took care of their leaders. And so I'm assuming that that money is primarily going to help care for the church. What well, is going to help care for the church at Jerusalem? And I'm assuming that part of it's going to, to some of their leaders and part of it is going to the widows. Now the Macedonian churches up there, they are not a wealthy bunch. The Corinth is much different. And so I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I just want to pull out a, a few verses here in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of what? Generosity. He, he's writing to the church at Corinth. Hey, your sister, your brothers and sisters up there in Macedonia, those churches, they are poor, but because of their generosity, they are a very generous people because of the grace of God. And he explains that these poor churches in Macedonia, they gave according to their means. But look at verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says to the Corinthians, as you excel in everything, all the gifts, faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, love, those are the gifts that they were excelling in. See that you excel in this act of grace also. What's the act of grace? Giving, generosity. He's saying, I want you to excel in this act of grace. So that Paul teaches this. Paul teaches that giving is a grace in and of itself. Not that you get grace, but that it's a, re it's a demonstration or a reflection of God's grace in your life. Uh, Randy Alcorn put it this way, that giving is a response to God's grace in, in our lives. He said, just as thunder follows lightning, so giving follows grace. So we call this grace giving. Not that you're giving grace, but that you're giving as a reflection of the grace that you have received in Christ. And then, as we move into chapter 9, we, as we move into chapter 9, Paul begins to, he begins to brag on the Corinthians. And he says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send the brothers up for a collection. And I, I don't want you to humiliate me, Corinth. I, I've been talking you up, even to the Macedonians. Have the offering ready to go. Let me show this to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. It reads this way. Now, it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. Sup superfluous, superfluous superfluous just simply means it, it's not necessary. I mean, it's, it's kind of going above and beyond. I mean, you already know this. It's super, superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, verse 2, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year. You guys have had the offering ready to go. Your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that our our, uh, so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this manner, but so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we, Paul and Luke, would be humiliated to say nothing of you being so confident. Verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift that you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift not as an exaction. 
So this was not Paul's way of kind of taxing all the churches to help Mama Church back in Jerusalem. He's saying, I, I want this to be a willing, generous gift that you come up with. And so today's message is very practical. Very practical, I think. I want us to begin, number one, I want you to see the marks of grace giving. The, the characteristics of grace giving, if you will. And I see this in verse 6 of chapter 9. The, the, here, here Paul says this. The point is this. You want to boil it down? Here it is. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever <coughs> sows bountifully <coughs> excuse me, will also reap bountifully. Paul gives this proverbial statement. You know what a proverbial statement is? A proverbial statement is a general statement of truth. The proverbs are proverbial statements. That is, they're not always ironclad, right? For, for instance, the Pro Proverbs chapter 11 reads this way. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should and only suffers lack. I would assume that if you were to walk through your neighborhood... That you would find people who have never given to a nonprofit organization in their life, and yet they seem to only increase in riches and only increase in wealth. Every time promotion comes around, they always seem to get the promotion. When the bonuses roll in at the end of the year, they always seem to have the newer car because of the size of the bonus. So, does that mean that Proverbs 11:24 is not true? Because the Bible says those who give increase in riches. And those who don't, what, and another withholds what he should give and only suffers lack. A proverbial statement is just a general statement of truth. That is true here. In chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. In fact, if you've ever wondered, if you've ever watched on TV... And you, get, you, you hear a, a, a TV preacher talking about seed money. This is often the passage that is referenced. Here it is. Uh, many within the prosperity gospel movement will kind of take this in a wooden, ultra-literal sense. Meaning by that, insert money, push button, and out will come riches. Send me your $25 and God will reward you fourfold. Folks, what we want to do, right, with any text of Scripture, we want to stay on the line and interpret it accurately. We, we don't want to go above the line and demand more of that text of Scripture than what it calls for. But folks, this is true as well, right? We don't want to go below the line and demand less of the Scripture than what it actually states. We, we want to walk the, the, the razor, the knife razor edge of truthfulness in the Scriptures, so, so to speak in nuances is a good thing for Christian people, right? We don't want a prosperity gospel, but neither do we want a poverty gospel. And what Paul is teaching here is this, is that Christian, rather than acting like a pond that collects all the water and becomes stale and stagnant, you should function more like a river that has multiple streams flowing off of it. Oh, there's a need here. Oh, there's a need there. there there's a need over here. Oh, I see this, and on and on it could go. These Christians received money. Immediately they were thinking of where their needs could be met. And what they're doing is they're looking to give as fast as they receive. This is the generosity that Paul is speaking about. So he says this, hey, I want you to give generously. That's what he's saying there in verse 6, right? Don't reap sparingly, reap bountifully. Or so bountiful. So the mark of grace giving is this. Number one, give generously. Here's the second one. Give joyfully. Look at verse 7. Paul says this. Each one, each one must give, where? As he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. 
So what does Paul instruct the Christians at Corinth that we are to give personally, privately, not obligatory in any way, but joyfully? You may have heard a, a pastor say this already, but you're to give, the Greek word there is hilarion. You're to give hilariously. You're to give with joy. You're to give with joy. So if you see, if you see giving as another bill, I want to say this, not only are you not doing it with joy, but you're robbing yourself of the joy that God intends for you. That is, joy recognizes. Joy recognizes that God uses these gifts to advance his mission. I want to say to the 12-year-old in here, and you gave a dollar bill this morning because you received an allowance, but you, just, you felt like God, God wanted you to give more. I want you to know this, that when you gave that dollar bill, part of that money is helping fund missionaries overseas. It's going to help church planters. The, the, the children's ministry curriculum that is being used right now, you may have given $17 this morning, and you're thinking to yourself, that's not much. But if you did it with joy, you're doing exactly the way God intended for you. This is a decision made in the heart between you and God. Before I move on, I should clarify what I'm speaking of this morning is Christians often, Christian people often talk about tithes and offerings. I'm not speaking of tithes, I'm just speaking about offerings. And a generosity tithe simply means that which is a tenth or ten percent. Now, if these are the marks of grace giving people, there are two natural concerns that may show up in your life or may show up, may show up in our lives. And that is, Pastor Joel, it's, it sounds like this is what I should do. But, I, you know, there's been times where I've tried to start something spiritually and I started for two or three months. And then eventually I kind of just wore off because I kind of got tired. I just didn't keep up with the discipline. Or... If I actually start, like I know my budget, if I actually start giving generously, where's that money going to come from? And so the natural questions that arise are, are these. Will I have the desire to continue to give? That's one. And number two, is God going to meet all my needs? So I want to show this to you. Number two, the provision that God, that God gives to people, to grace givers. The provision. But Paul, in 2 Corinthians 8, he connects one's financial giving with a work of God, number one. And he says, there will not be a depletion of your resources. The question is, does, does he mean that there's not going to be a depletion of my physical resources? Like, Joel, I'm no, I'm no accountant, but if I give X, then I know I don't have X over here in my bank anymore, right? What Paul does is this. I'm going to read this verse to you five different times. In one verse, he uses a comprehensive word. Let me show this to you. Look at verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse... Actually, I, I said verse 9, verse 8. Look at verse 8. God, here's the comprehensive words. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things... At all times, you may abound in every good work. <coughs> so you have all, 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 every. It, it isn't until we get to verse 9 that we understand that Paul is not talking right now about monetary financial resources. When, he's, when we just read that in verse 8, he wasn't talking about finances quite yet. What he's saying is this, is the engine that drives my generosity isn't the size of my paycheck. It's not my large-heartedness. What, what drives the engine of my generosity is this. It is God's 
grace. He's saying that it's all grounded in God's generosity with me. Look at verse 9. I'll read this time. He quotes Psalm 112 and he says, He has distributed freely. So maybe he's talking about physical, physical resources here. Let's keep going. He has given to the poor. Aha, he must be talking about material needs, right? Because he's talking about the poor. So keep reading, verse 9. His righteousness endures forever. What Paul is saying is this. This all grace, all sufficiency, at all times, on every good work. Where, and it's, it's distributed freely. It's given to the poor. And here's, here's how we know it is not material provision. It is spiritual provision because of this phrase. His righteousness endures forever. So the poor, in verse 9, has nothing to do with those who are financially poor. It has everything to do with those who are poor, in, who are poor spiritually, who need the righteousness of God. So how will my generosity continue to go on? It will continue to go on the same way that the righteousness of God has been imputed to your life. Forever and ever and ever. And if you can take it to the bank that the righteousness of God has been given to the poor, then, then bless God, then, his, then the, the grace of God, the generosity of God that you have received at salvation will continue to be the engine, the grounds, the foundation on which will continue to inspire, implore you to be generous Christians. That's what he's getting at. Say, well, Joel, that sounds good, spiritual provision, because I'm going to need, you know, when April 15th rolls around and i got to pay taxes, I'm going to need something outside of myself to kind of encourage me to continue to be generous. Well, he not only talks about spiritual provision, but he also does talk about <coughs> material provision. Because he's going to talk in just a moment about, about the God who supplies seed to the sower. Seed, that's like physical, tangible, you can put your hands on it. And bread for food. God is the one who does it. But why does he provide you with physical resources? Look at verse 10. He, that is God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. Why? For sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He replenishes your supply spiritually and materially for two reasons. So that you can continue to invest in eternal matters. And here's the kicker of it all. Look at verse 10 again. It's not so that you can just continue to sow the seeds that God has provided for you, but it's also so for a benefit on your part that you can have an increase in the harvest of your righteousness. So God gives so that we can give. Why? So that he can give us a harvest of righteousness. And you say, well, what's a harvest of righteousness? He's going to explain that in just a moment. But the provision for grace givers is this, is that he will continue to supply your need. What do I need? I need grace because I am not a generous person. I am a very selfish person. And you are too. I need that God would continue to supply all my needs. And God will do that according to verse 10. But I encourage you this way. To consider this. That according to verse 10, if God increases our standard of living that he intends to increase our standard of giving. That, that seems to be what verse 10 is teaching. So I want to lastly flesh out what does this mean of a harvest of righteousness? harvest of grace giving. I, I see four in the text. Harvest of grace giving. Uh, let's look at verse 11. Let me show you the first harvest. 
He says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. See, right? There's the standard of living and the standard of giving. Which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So I, I want to say this to you. Number one, here's the first harvest of grace giving. Is that God will provide for you for greater generosity. That is, we are not the end of God's generosity. That we are intended to be a conduit for greater generosity. Well, let me take it for a moment out of finances for a moment. The blessings that you receive are intended to bless others. So you have, some of you have more time on your hands than others. You're to use that time to bless others. Some of you are just incredibly gifted. You have your bandwidth for friendships is wide and deep. God expects you to use those to bless others. Some of you can see a need long before any of the rest of us see it. God anticipates and expects you to meet those needs. That God provides for you for greater generosity. I was thinking about this as we're in the process right now of preparing our budget present to a, a church body here in November for the new year. There's a lot of questions as to what's this going to cost for moving into a building, Lord willing. What is electricity? What is insurance? In the last year we made this kind of public pronouncement but that we wanted to move to get our budget where at least 10% of our budget is going towards missions. If I recall correctly, I think we're at 7 or 8% now. But as God grows us, it's not so that that money stays the same number. But it's so that we, when God blesses this church, that that money doesn't stay here, that that money goes out. And even beyond that, I'll just put it down for everyone for accountability's sake. But I want us to push beyond 10%. I want us to use more money towards church planting in the states, towards international church planting. Why? Because God provides for us, no, not so that we can have more, but so that we can bless others with more. This is the whole point of a, of a disciple-making church, that we hold people loosely. Why? Because we want to bless others. We don't want to become stagnant, pawn receiving gifts and it's all for our benefit why we want to become rivers of and tributaries of streams that bless other churches and impact the kingdom of god it's not just about finances but it's about resources and people here's a second harvest of grace giving it's found in verse 12 it reads this way for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints but get this, it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So when those widows at the church of Jerusalem received their stipend, if you will, from the deacons there at the church of Jerusalem, it wasn't just the fact that we're supplying the needs of the saints the church at Corinth, what's happening is this, is that those saints whose needs are met, they are overflowing in their thanksgiving to God. So here's what I see happening. I see this next year, people walking into Grace Life there on Puckmeister Road. Overwhelmed. Not by us, but we're a bunch of sinners. We all have our histories and the stains of our, our past. Overwhelmed by the wonderful, marvelous, sin-destroying, 
life-giving, wound-healing grace of the gospel. And when people walk in and they begin to give thanksgiving to God, I think we can accurately and appropriately make an application in saying that your generosity in providing for a brick your generosity and paying for some uh, tile. Your generosity in providing some, some polished concrete. Ultimately allows brothers and sisters to give thanksgiving to God. Look at the third one. It's closely tied to the thanksgiving that... God receives when people's needs are met, verse 13, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ. What were the Christians at the Jerusalem church glorifying God for? That these brothers and sisters in Corinth had confessed the gospel of Christ. And not only that, the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. The Jerusalem church glorified God for two reasons. The Corinthians confessed the gospel. The gospel. And the Corinthians' generosity toward them. Paul says that this generosity glorifies God. And my prayer is, God, if you would be willing, if you would make us faithful to the scriptures, God will receive the glory, not just in this generation, but when I'm long gone. And I'm pushing up daisies myself, so to speak. My body has turned to dust. And these seats are filled with a vastly different people. That the group that God has gathered under the name of Christ through the gospel of his son will be glorifying God. This is what God is calling us to. And lastly, I see this in verse 14. What's another harvest? What's another result? Verse 14. He says this. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. So verse 14 teaches us this, that because of this gift, the church at Jerusalem longed for the Christians at Corinth and they prayed for them. So here's the last harvest, the last reaping of generosity. Generosity prompts a spirit of brotherly love and affection for fellowship. Now, I, I will be really honest with you. In a thousand years, I never would have said that. I naturally would have never said, you know what? If you will be generous, it'll prompt a spirit of brotherly love and fellowship, but under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. The Spirit teaches us this, that your generosity actually prompts a spirit of brotherly love and fellowship. So if you find in your heart, are you suspicious? Questioning. One of the ways that you can actually quell those suspicions and quell those doubts according to the Apostle Paul and the inspiration of the Spirit is actually to be generous towards me. I'm using this primarily in the application of our building, but I think the application goes much beyond that, does it not, brothers and sisters? That if you want to grow in heart's affection towards other people, what you do is you watch and say, what needs can I meet with this brother or this sister? 
God will begin to explode. And as that generosity increases, do you know what will happen? Your prayers will increase. And then he finishes this way in verse 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Now, don't, don't read it this way. Wow, that must have been a really large offering. No, because you can count offerings. You can quantify coins. You can tabulate on the counting sheets what was given and what was, what was received and what was spent. But Paul says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Boy, what gift did God give that was inexpressible? That Peter would say of Paul, there are many hard things for him to, that, that he writes, and I can't even understand them all. What Salvation, ultimately, it would be Christ Himself. Oh, folks, do not, do not divorce your generosity from the gospel itself. According to the Apostle Paul, they are they are so closely entwined that he can come to the conclusion of chapter nine and say, "Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift." And he's talking about Christ. Now, interestingly enough, Paul never mentions a dollar amount. Or whatever the type of coinage that they had. He never mentions a dollar figure. Why, does he? Why, why does he not do that? Because, folks, it's never about the dollar amount. God is concerned about our generosity. He is concerned who receives the glory. He is concerned that He be praised. It's about God's grace alive and active in His people's heart. So if you find yourself <coughs> stingy, giving is the greatest antidote for those who are tight-fisted. If you find yourself thankless, Give to others, and gratitude to God will flood your heart and soul. If you find yourself burdened that God is not being glorified, find a need and meet it. If you find yourself lacking love and brotherly affection toward your brothers and sisters, meet a need. See, while well, giving meets financial needs, there's so much more than that. That giving is worshiping God. It's edifying your brothers and sisters. I say this to you, Grace Life. You can afford to be generous because your Father will provide for all of, our, for all of your needs. Friends, this is part of what it means for us to walk by faith. Let's pray. Father, some here this morning, they've come into Grace Life the first time. Long before we, we don't want to die, we want them to know Christ, Christ crucified, Christ buried, Christ risen again, Christ ascended, Christ reigning gloriously over his church. Lord, for those of us who have committed ourselves to this body known as Grace Life, we pray that you would give us wisdom. As we take this second offering, my ultimate concern is not even the amount, but it is the generosity of your people's hearts. So Lord, may they give privately personally, not obligatory, joyfully. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to, uh, you know what, Ben, I'm going to talk for a little bit, so if you play right now, you're going to be playing for a long time, brother. <laughs> you can do that, if that's, that's fine with me, just giving you a heads up. Does anyone need an extra card? These were in the bulletin, but if, before we do this, does anyone need a card? Okay, no one? So, 
just to just to, to reiterate. So, for instance, with me and my family, uh, we made a commitment for 20, October 2016 through October 2019. Now this goes through 2020. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write in here my commitment on this because I'm still continuing on with my commitment through 2019. Is going to go in my case September 2019 through September 2020. That way, we don't have an inflated amount. Okay. So if you if you already have made a commitment and you are God has led you to, to make an additional commitment, you can do that. And you don't have to put in your name, address, all that information. Well, if you put in your name, that would be that would that would help the, the financial folks out. And then you can make a you say, Joel, I don't I don't really know. So there's different lines here. There's a weekly, there's a monthly, there's an annual yearly, and then you say, you know what, I, I don't know what I can do, but maybe at the end of the year I get a bonus and I can give whatever. Okay. Um, so you can fill that out. For some of you, we've had people ask us this question. Uh, I have a gift, Pastor Joel, but it's not cash. I have some stocks I would like to give the church. And so we have talked with the Southern Baptist of Texas Foundation, and they are able to uh, help.